Well, if you've uh, if you're listening to this, then you've struggled through our first two podcasts, as this is episode three. So we welcome you if you're new, and if you've listened to the last two, uh, thank you. So episode three, before we get started, as you've heard on our first two, we're still kind of uh, figuring out what we're going to call this thing. Um, as I got shot down before, I was going to call this Fly Shop Talk, with emphasis on Shop Talk, but uh, Derek said, eh, that one kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, doesn't doesn't hold up. It's Do- mine. Derek? Better. No, 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 we're not, no, we're not going to talk about that one. <laughs> so... You guys can all thank Derek. Derek is the guy that wakes up uh, very, very early every morning. He's here in the shop at 6 a.m. to pack all of your orders from the day prior. So try to keep up with that uh, Jeff Bezos standard and getting things out as quick as possible. So Derek kind of falls on that sword and uh, packs everything up for a couple hours and gets it to the post office and UPS pretty much as they open. Uh, so we can get it out to you as quick as possible. So a quick shout out to Derek. Derek's also our uh, audio manager for the podcast here as he's got some good background in that helping us out. So um, as we get moving, yeah, let us know what you want us to call this thing. We've got uh, pretty much nothing as to what we should call it. So hopefully you guys can give us some ideas. If you listen to the other podcasts, we ask for it there. Um, And then future topics too. So today... Uh, our topic is uh, entry into fly tying. So last time our, our episode two was fly fishing. This is fly tying. Before we get started on that, check us out on all of our social media pages. We've got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and of course our website. Um, our website is www.risenfly.com. So intro to fly tying, how do we get into fly tying? What is it? Is it any fun? Does it save us money? All those questions we're gonna answer today. Um, So it's funny, you know, you're on, I'm on like 18,000 Facebook groups and you've got these fly tying groups and fly fishing groups. And and usually one of the first posts I see from somebody who just started fly tying is, look at this fly that I made up. And I usually put a big X on it and like, no, we're not gonna start out that way. Like, okay, I'm just going to throw some things, some dryer lint, some cat fur, and, you know, some Easter grass together and make a fly. Um, and, and that's not an exaggeration. I see stuff like that. Uh, that that's the kind of the worst way to start about doing it. That's like going out and golfing and, and picking up sticks in the woods instead of buying golf clubs. Like, you're not learning any skill sets by just trying to make things up. Um, so the first the first piece of advice in tying flies is keep it simple, just like I did in, in fly fishing. Don't go out there and, and try to do everything all the first year. Keep it simple in the beginning. Um, fly tying, here, here's my top three reasons and only three reasons to tie flies. Um, so number one, I tell everybody in the shop here, tie flies because you like tying flies. If it is work for you, Um, and you're like, oh, I just need to crank out two dozen pheasant tails and this is horrible, stop tying flies. You can buy them online for 99 cents on our site and other shops like that. Um, If you like tying flies, you enjoy it, it's kind of a relaxation therapy for you or a way to extend the season in the wintertime when there's two feet of snow on the ground, like tie flies. If you don't like tying flies, don't tie flies. It's kind of that simple. So that's reason number one. Uh, reason number two for tying flies, in my opinion, is you you find enjoyment out of catching fish on something you made. You know, I've got some buddies that make their own recurve bows um, and arrows, and they're like, that's awesome. Great for you. Or they build ARs, and they go out and, you know, plink at the range with them. Um, I did that last year. Like, oh, that's cool. I actually put that together or, you know, milled out your, your lower... Um, like, great. Yeah, kind of the same thing with tying flies. Like, you know, I tied this nymph and I went out and caught three fish on it today. Like, that's awesome. You get you get a little bit more excitement out of the sport um, when you tie your own flies. And number three is you save money. No, no, you don't save money doing this. <laughs> and number three is you get to uh, kind of tweak and adjust things. You might walk into a shop and catch a fish on something and you're like, that worked great, but maybe if that color was different or the size was different or I added something or subtracted something to it, um, it'll work better. You know, I've created my own patterns over the years. One of my patterns that I tweaked for a couple years that we have on our website is our foam backpack spinners. 
When I look at most spinner patterns, like a rusty spinner that has a, a poly wing on it, and you know it's sunk after a fish or two, or even before that, um, when I looked at the naturals on the water, it just didn't look as natural as, as, as I thought. Um, so I kind of adopted this pattern with actually using a ha an oversized hackle wing and clipping it on the bottom, putting a piece of foam on top that maybe floats it for an extra fish. I don't know if it does or not, but it makes me feel better at the end of the day. Um, and, and I usually make them bright colored on the foam so I can see them better. So I've kind of taken two or three things on a fly pattern that's kind of been proven over the years that I didn't really like and improved them. Um, so creating your own stuff eventually is, is a good reason to tie flies. Um, the reason why I say it doesn't save money is because you end up buying a bunch of stuff and using 10% of it. You know, you buy a spool of black thread and then your next pattern you need brown and then you need tan and red and, you know, you've got 15 spools of thread and you've used 10 yards on each of them. Um, if you used all of them, like, you know, great. Um, but then, you know, it's the same thing with materials. You buy pheasant tails, you buy hackle for dry flies, and all of a sudden you need six other colors of hackle. Um, you're not going to tie enough blue winged olives and March browns and caddis to, to use up the whole neck and all of those all of those things. So you won't save money in the long run. The only way you do it is if you're ultra specific. Like, you know, we do a lot of steelhead fishing around here in northwestern Pennsylvania, and you're like, I'm just going to tie egg patterns. Like, okay. You buy hooks, you buy thread, you buy egg yarn, maybe some beads, and you tie 500 of them, you might make some money. You know, it might cost you 15 or 20 cents a piece rather than a dollar or, you know, whatever in the stores. Um, but that rarely ever happens because you do that and you're like, oh, now I can tie other stuff. So keep it simple in your first year. Um, the best advice I can give for the first fly that you tie is find an exact pattern, something you want to tie, whether it's a woolly bugger or a nymph. I always recommend one of those first. Walk into your shop, ask the shop employee to get you all the materials that you need for that. So let's say you walk in and you're like, I wanna, I wanna tie a pheasant tail. So they'll tell you, well, you need pheasant tails for that. Not the fly, but the actual feather. So you need pheasant tails, you'll need peacock, you'll need wire, um, and you'll need hooks and potentially beads. I like beads for beginners because one of the biggest mistakes beginner fly tires make is they crowd the eye and the bead kind of uh, helps protect you from doing that because that's in front of the eye. Um, but also beads are great because when you're fishing nymphs, you want them to get down anyways. There's times you want unweighted, but um, a little bit of weight, whether it's brass or tungsten works great. So go in and find all the materials that you need for tying just one pattern. Um, go home, look up the recipe online or especially YouTube, or have the fly shop owner. Like I literally just did this about three days ago for a guy. Um, he broke his collarbone, so I'm hoping he's out there and uh, and actually trying to tie some flies. Um, but he wasn't able to fly fish, so he's like, I'm gonna learn how to tie flies while I'm recovering. So I tied him one in front of him. Like, okay, here's how we do it. Here's how we measure the materials to make sure our our dimensions are right. Here's how we attach the thread to the hook before we even start anything, which blew me the first time I ever. Uh, um, tied my first fly. It's like, I don't know how to do this. Do I tie a knot? Like, no, you just wrap it forward, wrap it back over top of itself and you're good. Like that was a mind blow for me because I had no idea what I was doing the first time I tied flies. You know, how do we attach this? How do we wrap it? How do we counter wrap with, with wire to make sure it doesn't fall apart? Um, you know, all those things. So I actually did that for the guy here in the shop. Um, so he learned step-by-step step how to tie the pattern. And then I gave him all the materials to go home and try it himself. Even something like a whip finisher. That's the one thing that everybody struggles with when they first start tying flies. This stupid little tool that kind of twists around and you can't figure it out. And like, you know, it, it's it's like stupid. Like, how does this work? And then all of a sudden you figure it out and you start whip finishing in like two seconds flat. Um, but get someone to help you out. YouTube is your friend. We've got a lot of uh, great YouTubers out there. Um, check out one of the guys that we've been sponsoring for about two years now, McFly Angler on YouTube. Uh, we've been working with him. Uh, shout out to him right now. He does amazing fly tying videos. He's got 4K video out right now. Um, just uh, his new Game Changer fly that he did a tutorial for um, is just through the roof awesome and how to tie that fly. Um, and you get high quality video and up, cl up close uh, uh, demonstration on how to tie something like that. But he does a lot of great stuff both on regular flies and then flies that he's kind of created over the years. So shout out to McFly Angler. Go check him out on YouTube. He's got some great stuff. So like I said, we're tying a pheasant tail. 
pull up a fly on YouTube. Um, one of my other favorites is Davey, Davey McPhail. Check him out. Um, and let someone walk step by step with you. Uh, also, there's this amazing thing on YouTube called a pause button. So if you get stuck on something, like just pause it, rewind, look at it three times before you go um, and, and figure it out. Um, so now you've got all your materials, you're at home, you got your vice. Don't spend a ton of money on your first vice, you know, 100 bucks max, um, just to see if you like it. You might hate it, you might love it, and two years later you buy a $500 vice. Who knows? Um, but just get, you know, get into it, spend 50 to 100 bucks on a vice, get some decent tools and materials. Um, and go out and tie flies. So um, my best advice once you've tied your first pheasant tail is do it again and again and again and again. Tie that same exact pattern the same exact way at least a half a dozen times in a row because the best thing that's going to happen is the thing that you made a mistake on last time, you're going to fix the next time. And those legs on the pheasant tail that were two times too long, you're going to get the right size the third time that you do it. Um, so if you if you start tying the you know a brand new thing after that you know you tie one pheasant tail and one woolly bugger and and you know one uh, zonker streamer and and one whatever else hair's ear if you do one after the next after the next of a completely different pattern you're not going to improve on things um, as much as if you tie the exact same thing over and over again plus you already have all those materials out in front of you and you don't have to take stuff out and put stuff away. So tie the exact same thing. And I like doing this even when I'm doing it myself here in the shop or at home. You know, tie a half a dozen of the exact same thing over and over again. You'll get quicker at it. You'll get better at it. The quality will come out better. Um, and then you'll get more proficient at it too. Instead of tying three flies in an hour, you'll tie eight flies in an hour. Um, so a great advice is just tie the same thing back to back to back over and over again. Um, so now you've tied off a half a dozen pheasant tails and you're like, okay, I'm getting pretty good at this. What's next? Go to the fly shop again, rinse and repeat. Okay, now I want to tie woolly buggers. What do I need for that? Well, what color do you want? Olive. Okay, olive woolly bugger can catch every fish in the ocean and, and the streams. Um, so uh, go out to your shop. They'll tell you, okay, you need streamer hooks. You need chenille. You need wire. Hey, I already have wire. Great. You don't have to buy more. Uh, you need marabou for the tail and you need some sort of saddle hackle to wrap it. Like they're going to go and walk through and pick up all those things for you. Maybe they'll, once again, they'll tie it for you again, look up a YouTube video and, and crank a couple of those out. Like, you know, go ahead and, and put it on your vise and tie four or five, six, seven of those in a row. And now you've got a pheasant tail, you've got a nymph, you've got a streamer. You can go out and catch a ton of fish on those. Um, take, uh, take your first... Uh, fish that you caught on a fly that you tied, take a picture of it and take that fly and take it home and put it in a shadow box or, you know, just stick it in a piece of foam and put it in front of your tying vest. Um, take your first fly you ever tie to, whether you use it or not, and set it up there as an example of, this is where I came from. You know, it's so funny, especially those guys that tied something that is absolutely nothing that's ever existed before. And, uh, you know, like I said, they use their cat's fur for it. Um, and then they look back and like, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? You know, after they started tying some flies, um, you know, I think it's a great, uh, it, you know, it's kind of the beginning of a timeline there of, of looking back at what things started and how they are today. Um, so it's kind of fun to look back on that. So save your first fly, don't fish it, put it in a little box or, you know, make a, make a shadow box or a picture with it sticking out of it, uh, you know, or, or find, you know, uh, get a bluegill mounted and put it in its mouth, whatever. Um, so yeah, as you're tying flies, kind of the same thing as fly fishing. Like you might get in and be like, okay, I really like tying these and I hate tying these. So buy dries when you don't want to tie dries and tie a bunch of nymphs and streamers or vice versa. Um, and the same thing as I talked in episode two of, you know, I really like fishing small streams for wild trout. Like you might come in here and be like, I just like the artistic style of things. Like I've got a good friend of mine, shout out to Doug. Um, who ties ultra realistic flies. It takes him hours and hours and hours to tie one single fly. And you look at it and besides the hook sticking out of its butt, you're like, they just flipped a rock and pulled that stone fly out. Or he's got one that's incredible. That's um, it's a mayfly molting out of its uh, nymph shuck. Um, and I look at this thing and I'm like, I couldn't tie that in a million years. But he doesn't tie a whole lot of flies to fish with, but he does this because it's like super cool and he's got some skill set to do it. Um, and he uses them for displays and sells them to people here and there. 
Um, maybe you go ultra specific on that, or maybe you're like my other buddy Chris locally who um, he got so specific, he just targets musky and pike locally. A little bit of smallmouth here and there. Um, so now all he ties are gigantic musky flies, and we actually sell some of them here in the shop too. So he's got flies with, you know, uh, bucktail and synthetics and flash and big old popper heads on them and, you know, tandem hooks and vinyl tails and, you know, wire leader on them. And it's just kind of crazy, uh, all the stuff that he throws together to catch these big, big toothy critters. But that's what he loves on the fly fishing side. So that's what he loves on the fly tying side. Um, so same thing in, 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 uh, fly fishing, where right? I said, just go out and fish like your first year, go out and tie flies that you have a specific pattern for and tie them over and over again. Just generic fish catchers, go catch, you know, pheasant tails and hares ears, woolly buggers, uh, zonkers streamers, like a slump buster, or, you know, just any sort of zonkers. Maybe you look into bucktail and you tie some clouse or minnows, like things that are guaranteed to catch fish no matter where you go, learn some skill sets. Um, and that's why you follow recipes for these things too. If all of a sudden you're just like throwing things on a hook, you're not learning anything. Um, you're going to learn how to palmer a hackle on a, on a woolly bugger so that you can use it on uh, tying an elk hair caddis for a dry fly. Um, dry flies are kind of uh, advanced for a someone just getting in because your your dimensions need to be right for it to sit right on the water. Um, technically on a dry fly, the tail, the bend of the hook, and the hackle tip should all sit flat when you lay it on a, um, on a, on a tabletop. Um, and that's pretty much for your Catskill style flies, which I don't want to get too deep on those. So those are a little difficult. Like if you put the legs too long in your pheasant tail, it's still going to catch fish. If your woolly bugger tail is too long or too short, sometimes you miss fish if it's too long, but you'll still catch fish. It's going to look like what it's supposed to look like. If you tie, you know, a size 16 blue winged olive with size 10 hackle, uh, that's not going to look right. And most likely it's probably not going to catch fish. It's going to sit on its side. It's going to fl you know, flutter too much. It's just not going to look like the bugs that are on the water there. Um, so maybe keep dry flies until season two or three of, of tying flies. Keep it simple, find specific patterns, get the exact materials that you need for it. Don't go out and buy one of those materials kits from, I won't mention the, the names of those big box companies. Um, they just have a bunch of junk in them and 90% of it's unusable and the other 10% is not high quality. Um, go to your shop, find specific stuff so that you don't have all this junk laying around that you don't know what to use. Um, and tie three, four, five, six patterns your first year and just get proficient at those skill sets. Learn how to add dubbing onto a hook for a hare's ear. Learn how to attach pheasant tail fibers and wrap it around a hook and counter wrap with wire well so that you can tie a decent amount of pheasant tails because those skill sets are going to be used in other ties that you're going to learn year two and three. Um, you know, learn how to hit a golf ball. And then all of a sudden you can work on drawing and fading the ball. You can work on hitting a flop shot around the green. Like don't do that your first year. Like just try to hit the ball in the hole. Yeah. It's difficult for even the pros. It's <laughs> for sometimes us, we go out and fish and still get skunked. Like it happens. Um, but tying in the beginning, just, just go out, keep it simple, learn some, patterns, learn some skill sets. And then each year after that, you can, you can, you know, get it, get more advanced. You can start creating your own patterns. You can tie better dry flies. You can tie tiny stuff. You can add new skill sets like stacking deer hair for poppers, which I still don't do because it's crazy to me that these guys do this and, you know, and uh, put out amazing looking uh, topwater bugs or tying um, baby duck patterns, uh, all this crazy stuff that they do with deer hair. Um, so yeah, keep it simple in the beginning. Get a, a, an inexpensive vise, get a handful of hooks and beads and materials to tie specific flies and go out there and do it, catch some fish with it, have some fun. Um, and then every year after that, add something to it. You know, yeah, tie a new pattern, challenge yourself. You know, maybe you go saltwater fishing once or twice on your family vacation. And like, okay, I'm gonna try a crab pattern. Like, okay, uh, go ahead and try to learn some skill sets on how to do that. Um, but Keep it simple in the first year. So, like I said, as if you've heard the other podcasts, I can talk on for hours and hours, but that is going to be it for today. So we've walked through of uh, all the things that you need to just get started. Um, your local fly shop will definitely help you out. We would be more than happy to answer some questions for you as well. So you can hop on any of our social media pages. We actually have a new chat function on our website too. So you can hop on there, which is www 
www.risenfly.com um, and chat with us, and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions there. And then if you didn't catch the beginning, you can catch the end. We still need help naming this monstrosity of a podcast that we are starting here. Um, so shoot some comments below. Let us know what you think. And then uh, any requests for future things. Uh, we've got a few people in the industry locally in Pittsburgh we're going to talk to. Um, I've got a local guy that actually makes uh, some dubbing that I want to get on here. Um, we've got uh, a world-renowned fly fisher in the Pittsburgh area. I won't drop his name. Hopefully we'll get him on here got a couple of local artists in the Pittsburgh area that are specific to fly fishing. So I want to try to get some of them on as some guest speakers and chat a little bit, maybe some other guides in the area, um, continue to talk topically on things like this. And then, you know, maybe we'll uh, just do some Q&A sometime soon. So if you have any questions on things, you can drop those below. We'll devote some future podcasts to that as well. Thank you guys for listening to us once again, and we'll see you next time.